In this tutorial, we're going to cover metal volcanoes and specifically what to do with them. You may, it may not be in your best interest to use them for metal. It may actually be in your best interest to use them for the heat they provide. So I'm going to try and cover here what you should, what you could potentially use the metal volcanoes for, what most of them are best suited for, and the odds of actually ending up with a particular metal volcano on your map. Okay, the first thing to cover is the chances of you ending up with a metal volcano on your map. Now, over here we have the percentage chance of you ending up with gold, copper, iron, and finally, any volcano type at all. So, on any given map you play, you have a 70% chance of ending up with a metal volcano somewhere in your biomes. Now, I pulled all these numbers from the Tools Not Included database. All I did was a search for the relevant type, compared it with the total number of maps available to get it. This is just uh, the numbers listed here, but the percentages are all you really need to care about. Now, Knowing that you're going to have a 70% chance of having a metal volcano, what you want to do, depending on which one you have, is up to you. But gold is probably the most valuable of the three. Gold gives you a material that has a high decor value, a plus 50 degrees to overheat for anything you build it, build with it. Copper, not so much. Copper has about a, I think it's a 20% decor bonus, but no overheat bonus, making it much weaker. And iron has no decor bonus, no overheat bonus, and is also the hottest of the three. If we compare the heat capacities here, you can see gold has very small heat capacity, copper's a lot more, and iron is quite high, meaning iron is the hardest to tame, gives the least benefits, and simultaneously iron literally falls out of the sky in the space biome. Okay, this is just a visual aid for how much cooling is required to reduce the output of an average volcano down to a temperature of about 20 degrees. So for gold volcanoes, it's about nine Huizwarts. Copper, you're looking at uh, 24, and iron, you're looking at 31 Huizwarts. That's assuming the Huizwarts were all in at least 2.2 kilos of hydrogen. Another thing to bear in mind, an anti-entropy nullifier is worth the same as about 6.66 Huizwarts. So you could, of course, use a combination of Huizwarts and anti-entropy nullifiers to provide your cooling if uh, you had the technology to do so. However, in most instances, I, unless you've got into space and you really, really just want to use lots of Huizwarts, your best bet is to, to go with a more energy-based solution for cooling. All of that done, how much actual material are we looking at here if we do cool these volcanoes down? Well, I basically pulled the same thing again. I went to the map database, pulled a bunch of maps, grab the, the averages outputs. This is what the average output of a gold volcano is. Average output of an iron volcano. This is in grams a second, by the way, over its entire life cycle. Uh, copper volcano. And then I just averaged all of the data I pulled just to give me a rough estimate. So about 336 grams a second is the average output of a metal volcano. Now, my data set is not exactly enormous here. I, I didn't want to go through and pull thousands of maps. Uh, if someone has a larger data set where they've pulled more data, please put it in the comments, link me to it, I'll update the descriptions. But about average, you're looking at about 336 grams of material a second for each volcano type. That works out at roughly every 100 cycles, about 20 tons. So you could have 20 tons of gold, copper, or iron every 100 cycles, depending on whether or not you are interested in that or not usually it's worth it. Most maps will go on for about 700, 1,000 cycles or so, and taming a metal volcano, usually quite useful. Now, next up, we have to kind of cover what you should do with the metal volcano. Before we get into actually extracting metal from it, we need to look at petroleum boiling, because it is a very big part of the game in many ways. The main benefits of petroleum boiling is it's a renewable source of energy, up to 10 kilowatts of power a second. That you could, and it's water positive at the same time, also produces lots of CO2, useful for slicksters or, you know, grinding out soil. However, the problem is you need to heat up crude oil to 403 degrees, which is rather energy intensive. Uh, using a counterflow heat exchanger, this is an old design, by the way, there's, there's more efficient methods of doing it that have been determined since. Um, you can actually preheat your crude oil coming in and you can save on energy. In this instance here, we're about nine degrees short of the required temperature when the crude oil gets to the, the actual boiler itself. So what we're looking for here is what kind of volcanoes we can use to actually boil crude oil into petroleum, giving us 
lots of energy, lots of power, lots of things like that, which may be very useful depending on your map. So what we're going to try and do here is cover what kind of volcanoes would be useful for this and what ones would not, and what situations it would actually be a good idea to go for the heat of the metal instead of the actual metal itself. After spending an embarrassing amount of time with the calculator, I came up with a few rough numbers. Now, bear in mind, these are rough. I'm making some assumptions here. You need 500 degrees at least on your metal or, or magma to actually do any temperature shift. A few things like that, but this is just a, a rough guideline. Uh, a gold volcano can manage about 5.4 degrees of shift on 10 kgs of petroleum a second. And this is assuming average volcano, average everything. So a gold volcano is not a very good choice for actually boiling petroleum. It can only manage 5.4 degrees. You would need a, a large counterflow heat exchanger to manage that. Copper comes in at about 13 degrees. Um, now, so bear in mind, that's a 10 kgs of petroleum a second. If you had, if you were running your petroleum boiler at half speed, you could get about 26 degrees of temperature shift using a copper volcano. Uh, 18 degrees for iron and a minor volcano for comparison. Uh, the minor magma volcanoes are the, the smallest of the magma volcano types. That can manage about a 35 degree temperature shift on 10 kgs of petroleum a second, meaning you could go with a quite a much smaller heat exchanger on those. So this kind of gives you a rough idea of what you could use the the, the volcanoes for, and uh, just just a couple of numbers here to just to cover things. Uh, your chances of having a volcano or a minor volcano on your map are about 32 percent, same as gold, copper, and iron. Uh, but the chance of having any magma volcano, either minor or uh, regular, is about 55%. The chances of having an iron, a copper, or a magma volcano, basically any of the volcano types excluding gold, is about 81%. So you have an 81% chance of ending up with, well, at least one of those three options. So you've got really good chances of having, you've got 80% chance basically of having a good source of heat for a petroleum boiler, which makes a good case for petroleum boiling being an option. Now, all that said, if you've already got a miner or a magma volcano ready, you may actually just want to tame that iron volcano. And we'll cover how to do that. Maybe you have a gold, which you will usually definitely want to tame for the metal. And copper, I would still lean towards using the copper primarily for a petroleum boiler if needs be and I would only tame it if I had some other source of heat for doing my petroleum boiling. Anyone who has seen the previous metal tamer design will notice that there is huge similarities. There has only been some minor modifications and the minor modifications were to prevent metal tiles from forming here. There was a few reports of metal tiles forming here. I had it happen twice on my gold volcano over about 1000 to 1200 cycles. This requires you to put in a miner, it complicates things. So to prevent that from happening, uh, this is the mechanic that causes it. Uh, here is 800 kilos of liquid iron. Here is 801 kilos of liquid iron. And if I unpause the game, you'll notice that the 800 kilos turned into debris and the 801 kilos turned into a solid tile. Uh, effectively, what you want to do is prevent 800 kilos of liquid iron ending up in one spot or 801 kilos of liquid iron ending up in one spot Otherwise, it will, when it cools, solidify into a tile. Uh, so what was happening was the heat here was not being dealt with quickly enough, which meant at some point 801 kilos of iron or appropriate material would accumulate in liquid form, and then when it cooled, it would form a tile and then would gum up the system. So to prevent that, there have been a few changes made. Namely, I have just increased the heat capacity in here to ensure that the, the heat is moved instantly or as quickly as possible in here. And I ran it successfully for a few hundred cycles, eating three metal volcanoes with zero issues. That out of the way, here's how it works. The metal volcanoes erupt. Uh, these things are surrounded in obsidian tiles usually, or, well, I've used insulation here just for this. This was a test map. But uh, in actual survival modes, I use obsidian because obsidian has the highest melting point of all the insulated tiles that you would have access to in a reasonable time frame. For example, here's a ceramic tile, and we'll compare that with an obsidian. Now, the ceramic tile has a melting point of 1800 degrees. The, the obsidian tile has a melting point of 2700 degrees, meaning it will not melt no matter what metal it comes in contact with. Now, it's unlikely that the temperature will get into the tiles that much, but it's a good idea just for best practices to use obsidian when dealing with metal volcanoes. Now, the liquid metal will flow out of the volcanoes and drop down here into the cooling plate. Now, this is a vacuum. This is a vacuum area. 
So the only way that this metal can exchange heat or anything is through the tile it is touching beneath it. It can exchange heat with the tiles on the left and right of it or the temperature shift plate. The temperature shift plate is only there to transfer heat from the door into this metal tile. It helps sort of speed the heat movement this direction. Now this door is made of steel. Normally I try to avoid this because steel has a, an over, a melting point of 2400 degrees, which means the iron and gold volcanoes could potentially melt them. However, since we are removing the heat so quickly, that doesn't happen. Uh, we've removed that possibility by increasing the heat capacity over here. So the iron flows down here, hits these uh, metal doors. These metal doors move the temperature into here. Now, in here we have a temperature shift plate behind here and a temperature shift plate behind here made of diamond. All the rest of the temperature shift plates I'll cover in a bit, they're made of granite, but they basically help suck the heat out of these metal tiles and dump them into this steam room here. Now, the total amount of liquid in here is about, or steam, is 600 kilos. I put in 600 kilos of steam in here. It's easier to do it that way because a bottle emptier, assuming your duplicates are pulling from a water pump, will they'll carry 200 kilos at a time. That's the maximum they can empty into a bottle emptier. So assuming your duplicates aren't noodle arms of some sort, they will pick up 200 kilos of water and dump it in, meaning three runs will give you the required amount of water exactly. Now, the steam in here gets heated up, passes through these two steam turbines, deleting the heat, and then once it gets to the top, these two gas pumps at the top pump down the steam and return it to the bottom. So in this way, all the heat is deleted and the steel is actually cooled down. However, how do we get the steel out of here and actually somewhere useful? Well, that's where this temperature sensor comes in. Uh, this temperature sen sensor here is set to 235 degrees. So it can sense when the temperature in here has dropped to 235 degrees. And when it does, it will send an automation signal. The automation signal will be sent across here to this AND gate. This AND gate is hooked up to a, a clock sensor. So when this temperature sensor says the temperature in here is 235 degrees and the clock sensor goes it's X time of day, the door will open and the metal will drop down to the second cooling level. Now I have set the activity duration at 0.5%, so it only opens for a tiny fraction of the day. And it's just to make sure that w this metal will not be dropped until it has reached a, quite a reasonable temperature, usually about 300 degrees or so, usually maybe a little bit less. So this hits the, the correct temperature, this hits the correct time of day, the metal will get dropped down to the second level. Once the metal is down here, literally the exact same thing happens. It's actually hooked up to the exact same temperature sensor. Now, why do we have double doors? The reason for the double doors is that there is a potential that at this time of day, one of these, the volcano might be erupting and it might try and dump metal down here just as the doors open. And then the metal could fall all the way down to the bottom and cause us problems down here, interrupt our plans. So the whole reason for the second door is to just stop that metal escaping, to make sure that it definitely has to hit a temperature shift plate. Also ensures that the metal is usually quite reasonably cool by the time it gets out of there time clock here is set to the opposite time of day to this one to ensure that they uh, operate at different times and at no point is there a gap going from top to bottom. Now this other temperature sensor here is set to 270 degrees. Actually you can set that to 275 if you want. The reason for this one is we want to draw as much heat as possible out of here into here. And when we do that, we don't want to go above 275 degrees because the gas pumps are made of steel and their maximum overheat is 275 degrees. So the heat gets dumped in here. This thing detects if it starts getting so warm that it will eventually start to damage the gas pumps, at which point it will disengage these two doors. You will notice these two doors here. They're basically the thermal injectors or the heat injectors. They're, they're transferring the heat from these uh, metal tiles over here into the steam area. So, so long as the temperature in here remains below 275, this will just constantly keep deleting heat. Now, what are all these temperature shift plates made out of granite doing here? Well, this is to do with sort of heat storage. Uh, the metal volcano has released an awful amount of heat in a very short period of time. They only erupt for 25 seconds, but that's the biggest danger point. That's when you've got the highest possibility of having that molten metal there and possibly forming a tile. So to counteract that, we have included an awful lot of granite. Granite is not the best thermal conductor, but it has a half decent capacity and half decent thermal conductivity, which means it can store an awful lot of temperature. Each one of these tiles is 800 kilos of granite. And as such, we can store an awful lot of temperature in them. This ensures that when the metal drops down, 
all the temperature will get sucked out of there very quickly. These doors barely ever disengage. It's very rare. Usually it takes all three of these erupting at the same time. This ensures all the heat is removed as quickly as possible, and it usually keeps us running quite hot in here for quite a long period of time. So, after the metal has finally passed the first level, the second level, it will drop down to the third level. The third level down here is final stage cooling. By the time the metal gets out of here, it's actually going to be quite chill. This is 275 degree iron. By the time it gets down here, it'll probably still be about 275 degrees, to be honest. But it will drop down here and lie on this tile. Then what happens is we have a few more time sensors here. It is This one here is connected up to the uh, auto sweeper. The auto sweeper will pick up the iron and dump it into this conveyor loader. You can see here the time of day it's activated to come on at, which is just after the metal is dropped down. So the metal drops down, this conveyor loader activates, or this uh, auto sweeper activates, dumps it into the conveyor loader. Now the conveyor loader has a very nice thermal conductivity of 60, which means any metal in here is going to exchange lots of temperature with the surrounding environment, which is very nice because we have a bunch of cool water here, all cooled down to about 10 degrees or a little bit lower in places. This ensures that the metal starts dumping its heat into that water and cools it down to uh, about 30 degrees or so. Let's see. The metal eventually comes out at about mm, yeah, 16. 16 degrees is the average temperature we're getting the iron out at. So it's dumped in there, but it doesn't immediately get conveyed out. There is actually another clock sensor, even more automation here, and that automation is, goes across here and is hooked up to the conveyor loader. So the conveyor loader is left off for most of the day and only turns back on again after a whole cycle has passed. This is when it's loaded in, and this is when it actually activates, which is the basically a whole day passes, at which point it has cooled sufficiently that we just let it out here on this conveyor rail where it gets dumped into these three uh, conveyor receptacles. Then we have a final auto sweeper, and that auto sweeper here is set up to a different time of day. We'll cover why this one is not just left on constantly in a minute, but that basically takes that and dumps it into these storage containers over here. Or you can leave it for duplicate access. It's really dealer's choice at this point. You've gotten it all the way out and it should be quite cool and ready for your duplicates to use. Now, how do we actually cool this area down? Well, that's where this aqua tuner comes in. What we've done here is basically just a, a, a basic cooling loop. This is polluted water to make sure we can cool it down nice and chill. And it's actually all controlled by this thermal sensor over here, a uh, liquid pipe thermal sensor. Now, liquid pipe thermal sensor is set to 10 degrees. This ensures that this area over here stays at 10 degrees pretty much constantly, sometimes a little bit lower, but that is linked back to the, up here to the actual aqua tuner itself. If the temperature in here goes above 10 degrees, this activates the aqua tuner, the aqua tuner starts circulating this water around and it helps chill down this whole area. Now this area over here will usually end up a bit cooler because most of the heat is going to be generated over here. And additionally, I have kept the thermal sensor here for a reason. These things occasionally let a bubble slip by. So that bubble, if it does slip by, will sit right here, right on top of the iron, and will usually cool it down or heat it up quite a bit so that we don't end up sending back any water that's less than 10 degrees. We don't want to do that because it could potentially freeze in the pipes. Uh, we're, we're playing it safer by using polluted water, but it's always nice to have a little bit of a safety margin in place. And that's basically it. Now, one of the big differences here is we've used two steam turbines instead of one. The reason for this is it actually helps with uh, energy efficiency costs. I can cool all three of these volcanoes down for about 130 to 200 watts of power. That's the entire cost of cooling all of these down. And the reason for that is we're actually recycling the power from these two steam turbines. They don't generate enough power to power the whole system, but they do generate enough that it's actually useful to capture it. Now, if we crack open the power overlay here, this whole system is actually run on one single conductive wire. That's it, a two kilowatt wire, that's all we're using. And you'll notice that we've actually got more potential power consumed, but we have a system in place to stop that from overloading. But you'll see the cable here is going through both the steam turbines. That's necessary if you don't have the cable going through the steam turbine and you don't have a power cable connected here, the steam turbines won't function. So you do have to make sure it has a power cable going through it and that's hooked back up here to these batteries. And we have a power shutoff here, which you'll notice is off. We're not actually connected to this uh, ghetto generator setup I've done. The reason it's off is these batteries are actually set up as a sort of a breakpoint. What's happening is when the uh, 
power in here goes below 20%, as in all three of these batteries are 20% power, it will engage this system here, at which point it will start drawing power from the main grid. Once the, tip, the power level in here goes up to 40%, it will disengage from the main grid and we will stop drawing power. This means at all points in the cycle, we will always have 60% power availability or 60% storage capacity available in these three batteries. Now, the reason we've done this is these steam turbines do run intermittently. And when they do run, they'll generate two kilowatts of power for a very brief period of time, at which point our batteries here can actually store the overflow. Now, I tried doing this with one or two batteries and there was some lost power. Uh, I don't know if it's a bug with the game or not, but it just will not store all the power coming out of one of these if it runs intermittently. By having three batteries, I managed to catch all the power and stopped losing some. So this helps mitigate the power costs. Uh, excluding the aqua tuner here, just running these two gas pumps, I think costs about 50 watts. If you wanted to, though, you could get rid of the two gas pumps up here and maybe get rid of the second steam turbine and put in a door pump system. You could use a, a hydrogen cloud at the top to trick the system into running all the time. There's, there's definitely other ways of... I don't want to call them exploits so much as there are other bugs you can take advantage of to generate more power, and I'll cover one of those near the end. But uh, if you're looking for a legitimate system, this one worked quite efficiently, and for 130 to 200 watts maximum, you're you're going to be able to tame any volcano you throw at it. Now, power-wise, this uh, wire will tell you that we have the potential to consume 2,500 kilo, 2.5 kilowatts. That would cause overloads and would cause shorts on these wires and cause them to break. However, because of the way the system is set up, uh, this door here will activate at this time of day, this door here will activate at a different time of day, those two cannot draw power at the same time. Uh, additionally, the conveyor loader and the uh, the auto sweeper here, also on a different time of day, also this auto sweeper is also set to a different time of day. So all of these all operate at different times of day, therefore they all cannot draw power at the same time. Having let this run for 200 cycles, Absolutely zero overloads or problems on the wire or uh, accumulated tiles of gunk. As far as I can tell, this should be literally a set and forget design where you put it down and you don't have to worry about maintaining it. So, pretty straightforward. Now I'll just do a quick run through all the settings again. So if you're doing an actual build on this, you can figure out what's going on. Uh, 1500 grams is set for the, the atmosphere sensor up the top, just to make sure that the, we're not actually pumping dry air. We don't want to turn that into a vacuum up there. Waste of power. Uh, this is the time settings for this clock center, time settings for this clock center, uh, and down here we have the time settings for the actual auto sweeper itself, and then the second auto sweeper, and then the final auto sweeper that takes them out. Though honestly, you could put this pretty much anywhere around here; it really doesn't matter. You've got the the space to do it in. Uh, this is the temperature sensor, 235 degrees is what you want to make sure this uh, has reduced to before you let the iron escape. This is the temperature sensor to disengage these doors, 275 degrees, to make sure that you don't overheat anything in here. Oh, and a, a quick note on the steam turbines. The thermal conductivity of these steam turbines does matter because the heat in here is actually transmitted through this into this steam to make sure it's hot enough to pass through the second turbine. So you might, you, you definitely do want to make the steam turbine out of copper or gold. Preferably copper. I prefer copper. It has a higher overheat temperature. But, or, oh, uh, melting point. You, it, you don't really want to make this out of steel. You'll be tempted, but don't. It actually has a thermal conductivity of 55, the steel, so you're better off sticking with something with slightly more thermal conductivity. Okay, this is a note on the actual power potential of these, if you don't mind using a, a little bit of exploitative behavior. This is a modification I've removed the... Oh, I didn't actually place in the uh, the final cooling solution here. All this is about is more how much power we can generate if we block off four of the five ports on the steam turbines. Now, in this uh, particular modification, I decreased the steam content in here to 400 kilos because I was blocking off these ports here so that this is only running on uh, one steam turbine chunk. What this means is these turbines are active, well, five times as much. And because of that, they're actually able to generate excess power and they actually generate more power than they consume. So the whole system can actually power itself. Uh, if we'll just speed up time here a bit. I just placed down these batteries and they were empty when I started. And as you can see, they're slowly starting to accumulate power. And they will actually accumulate more and more power as these volcanoes erupt. Actually, that one's uh, dormant, that one's active, that one is also active. So as steam is generated and heat from this, uh, this iron is actually dumped in, this will keep generating power. This is a very nice way to actually generate quite a bit of power from metal volcanoes while simultaneously getting metal out of them. 
However, I personally don't uh, approve of using this. I believe this will be patched out in future future patches. So uh, I, I just didn't want to include it as a main part of the tutorial. But uh, if you're all right with using it, just uh, put in a few, make sure you've got some temperature shift plates here and some metal to move that steam up here. Otherwise this uh, will be underpowered a lot because this will be active quite a lot and will end up cooling this area, then it'll overpressurize. It causes a mess. Just make sure you have some temperature shift plates to move the temperature over. A uh, note on best practices when dealing with uh, volcanoes like these and building a metal volcano tamer. Have a service plan in place. Uh, volcanoes are notoriously difficult to manage perfectly and you can always run into bugs, issues or problems. So what I have here is this is a liquid lock leads into this area here, which means if I have any problems at any point, I can deconstruct this tile and get into this vacuum room without actually causing any complications. This allows me to service this part. I can get all the way down to here, crack open this door, put in another ladder segment. It just means I can service this whole area here without actually without actually killing myself. Because otherwise, you're going. To, if you do run into a problem, it is really difficult to service the parts. Now, this is uh, the previous design, and the only differences are this one is missing the granite temperature shift plates to provide extra temperature hold, and we're also these doors are made out of wolframite instead of uh, steel. That is the only real difference, as and uh, the actual missing steam turbine. Now, uh, if you're having problems building one of these in actual survival mode, I will link to the video where I did a tutorial on this particular version and it shows you a time lapse of how to build it. It's effectively the same, except it's just missing a few temperature shift plates. Anyway, hope this uh, is informative for you and gets you working with those metal volcanoes you've got lying around your map, just doing nothing with them. Now I'm just gonna do a quick run through of this whole thing in fast forward so you can see it all operating. It usually takes a few cycles for it to drop metal depending on the frequency of the volcanoes, how much temperature ends up somewhere. It can cause all sorts of problems. Uh, so at the moment I've just got the temperature sensor right here selected. Once this hits 235 and one of these doors uh, chimes on, this will allow the door to open and drop metal, preferably down here so we can get a good look at it. Uh, when nothing's happening, I'm just going to fast forward this and play it at high speed. So uh, don't be alarmed if the, t the speed keeps going up and down. Temperature is now at the correct amount. The door on the top is about to activate and drop its metal. Boom, that gets down to the second level. Now, as you can see, the iron volcanoes have dropped a bunch of metal on the top tile. It's solidified and it's driven up the temperature inside the cooling chamber. So now we're not actually prepared to drop the second layer of metal just yet because there's too much heat inside the cooling chamber until right about now. Come on, just in time. And boom, we actually dropped the iron down to the bottom level. Now, uh, one modification I've decided to do because it actually works really well, I just tested it there recently, is if I actually replace this tile here, get rid of the insulated tile, and instead put in a metal tile made out of copper or gold. Either or will do fine. We'll stick in a gold tile because, well, why not? It's gold. Now, what that ensures is that it actually adds more conductivity right there, which helps with the cooling and actually makes things cool faster. As you can see, the auto sweeper activated. It moved the iron that had just fallen down. Uh, that iron was actually quite hot still. It's in the 270s. And it has dumped it in the conveyor loader, which it is rapidly dropping heat. And this is going to sit in here for a whole cycle. And when this activates it will dump it out across the rail and into these conveyor loaders so let's keep an eye on that temperature as the game progresses okay so what we have here is the temperature in here has dropped to 57 degrees that's because this exchanges its temperature so well with the surrounding area uh, if you'll notice the actual solid iron that's sitting here it's still at 210 degrees uh, this is why I, I played with dropping this on top of a metal door, touching some cool water first, but unfortunately the temperature cooling was just so slow it wasn't worth it. However, this has activated and it now sends this iron across the rail, and if you look at the actual temperature of the contents, uh, contents of 20 kilos at 45 degrees, it actually drops a lot of temperature going through the water as well. And then we end up with eh, metal around 30 to 40 degrees here. Now the iron that's there will stay there and keep cooling as well and get put back in and filled up. So that actually, the output here is going to get cooler and cooler as that big chunk of iron gets colder and colder before it's loaded in. Now, normally what you would do is you would place a couple of tiles right here. 
and this would stop duplicates actually getting in here and getting access to that hot iron because a duplicate can stand here and pull out that iron. And eventually the temperature will all even out to about 16 degrees. However, you are going to get some hot chunks occasionally where it'll be 50, 60 degrees, and sometimes it'll come out a lot cooler than that, usually about 10. But it all evens out about the same at the end of the day. Anyway, uh, last thing is you'll notice the aqua tuner there is going crazy, pumping the actual liquid around. And uh, that's because, well, it's currently destroying quite an enormous amount of heat. Uh, all the heat from the aqua tuner is dumped in here, and the steam turbines are effectively killing it and generating a little bit of power to go with it. Whole thing runs quite efficiently. Anyway, hope this works out for you. I'm going to include the save game file. You can use that to pick this apart, see how it all works, and sticks together. Should be a—it's not the easiest build to replicate, but it is rather useful. Enjoy.